Hello, my name is Caitlin Dornbus, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute's Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending today's presentation. The Dole Institute of S Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to the work of the Dole Institute. We attend regular meetings and assist in events like this and plan a SAB-sponsored program every semester. Members of the SAB receive great opportunities to network with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact the Dole Institute. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you. If you enjoy today's program, please let us know by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or through your own website email. If you prefer to write us a note, there will be a notepad and pens on the tables as you exit the building. Your attendance and feedback help shape the future of our programming. Before we begin today, I'd like to remind you to please turn off all cell phones. After the interview, we will have some time for audience questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I will be around with a microphone to come and help you. Um, please ask just one brief question though. Um, and now, please welcome the director of the Dole Institute, uh, Mr. Bill Blasey. Thank you very much, uh, Caitlin. Um, and Caitlin mentioned the Student Advisory Board program. We'll actually be doing this semester's Student Advisory Board program tonight. And it will be a moderated discussion on the topic of gun control. So uh, if you don't have plans for tonight, come back to the Dole Institute at 730. And you're going to hear a very fascinating discussion that's been arranged by our Student Advisory Board. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming out today. Um, this morning when I was driving in, I had to brave the waters of chaos, it felt like, a couple times. Uh, as the rain really uh, poured down uh, pretty well. But we're delighted to have uh, Jerry Dobson, Professor Jerry Dobson, with us today to talk about his new book. And it's not really new, but it's newly published, I guess. So, uh, but you can, you can fill him in on those details. Uh, Gwen and Jerry are very good friends of ours. And um, when I heard about Jerry's book and I heard about the subject matter, and we don't do a lot of novels at the Dole Institute, but this one just seemed really appropriate, seemed really interesting. Uh, so we're delighted that all of you came out and uh, hope that if you haven't picked up a copy of the book yet, that you will on your way out. I picked up my personal copy and got Jerry to sign it before all of you got here. Now, Jerry's um, you know, been introduced hundreds of times before. And so I suspect, I didn't ask him this beforehand, but I suspect he's probably tired of the traditional academic introduction. So I thought I would do something a little bit different today. I would try to tell you four things that you may not know about Jerry Dobson. So let's go with that, see, let's see. Okay, actually you probably know a couple of these, especially if you read the Journal World story, but anyway, there's a couple of them you probably don't know. One, Jerry was president of the American Geographical Society for 11 years. Two, he received his doctorate at the University of Tennessee. Now, why is that important? It's important to me because I received my degree from Vanderbilt University. And Vanderbilt University and UT are about like KU and Mizzou. So despite this fact, or in spite of this fact, maybe I should say, uh, Gwen and Jerry and Susie and I are good friends and uh, we've enjoyed great times with them and been to their home and done a number of programs. As a matter of fact, Jerry arranged for us to host two very exciting guests uh, during the course of, uh, of uh, our, probably about my first five years at the Institute. Not only did we have a representative from Google Earth uh, very, very early on, back I think in uh, 07, uh, but we also had the geographer of the United States here at the Dole Institute just a couple or three years ago, and we appreciate that very much. And the fourth thing you may not know about Jerry is that he has a twin brother who is, in fact, the co-author of the book he's going to talk about today. So there's your four things you may not have known about Jerry Dobson. Welcome him to the Dole Institute of Politics. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you can imagine why it took 19 years, if you imagine working with your brother or sister <laughs> on writing something uh, this long. Uh, I'm going to talk about the waters of chaos. The first time, uh, thing I'm going to tell you is where the name comes from. Uh, it's a term that's used throughout the ancient world, from Greece over through uh, 
India to represent the deluge. And it's not just one deluge, but they believed in the cycles of deluges that destroyed the world and then it rebuilt afterwards. So that's where it comes from. Uh, first, I want to thank the Double Institute of Politics for this opportunity. Bill Lacey and Heather Anderson uh, in particular have helped me get ready for this. I want to thank Matt Erickson for that wonderful article in the Lawrence Journal World on Monday. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure some of you are here because you read that. And then Krista Montgomery just this morning wrote something that I was equally pleased with at the uh, University Daily Kansan. So I really appreciate getting the word out. <clears throat> It's actually two books, the ancient, or excuse me, the modern book, The Waters of Chaos, The Modern Quest, is the story of a uh, geographer, scientist, working at a national laboratory who gets suspicious about ancient civilizations, and he goes looking for uh, the evidence. He, he mentions it to his brother, and his brother says, well, I've been thinking about that. Remember so-and-so, I told you so-and-so years ago. He was thinking about it, too. So the two get together and go searching for it using modern technology, high-tech, uh, uh, which geography is these days. It's very high-tech uh, in terms of geographic information systems, uh, GPS, sonar, and all of those things. The ancient book is the story of people living in that time and facing the global catastrophe of sea level rise. And we have combined the two. Uh, we still offer them separately because some, it's called a double genre problem when you put both into one book. And uh, a lot of publishers don't like that. Well, with modern electronic publishing, we could offer it both ways. So you can have your cake and eat it too. Um, the, uh, we're finding, though, that people who read the combined version actually rate High, rate it higher than people who read either of them individually. They explain each other as you go through, and it makes a lot more sense as you go through. Well, let me tell you the premise of the Waters of Chaos. And I'll start with this graph, which I have presented before in scientific forum for, as uh, the most important piece of evidence you will ever see to help understand the origins of the human species. Uh, particularly, and I'm talking primarily about uh, the time after modern humans came to exist and the cultures that developed, the, the culture that we've developed since then. And here's the most important thing about this graph. If you look at the modern uh, sea level rise and go back uh, 120,000 years, you see that it's about the same uh, sea level at that time as today, and it's the only time it's that way. Uh, 120,000 years ago, and that coincides precisely with the appearance of the first modern humans in the archaeological record. So the question is, uh, what happened in that zone? And we're talking about 25 meters lower than it is today for an un uninterrupted period of 104,000 years. And if you go down to uh, 68 meters, that was exposed uninterrupted for 59,000 years until this most recent rise. Go down to uh, 85 meters, that was exposed for 35 years. We're getting deep, folks. <laughs> Some people might say I'm getting too deep. But uh, now if we look at the 100 meter level, 325 feet down, that was uninterrupted, exposed for 12,000 years, twice the length of all recorded history. There's a lot of time there for a lot of mischief to have occurred, and it, the evidence of it, unless it was happening in the upper uh, zones too, the, the evidence of it would be below uh, 100 and, now, and even down to 125 meters deep. Now the lore behind the saga uh, the saga is the, the ancient one, and it's more based on lore, while the modern one is based more on science. Um, we scoured ancient literature looking for passages hinting at knowledge of sea level rises. And you find it in many places. Uh, you know, the flood myths are all over the world. And they're, they're called myths. They're dismissed as myths, but uh, th there may be some memory there. The, the, photograph, I mean, the uh, drawing that you're seeing right here is actually from an Aztec myth. And then there's the Bible. Uh, Noah's flood is the most prominent one, of course. Um, but there are other references in the Bible besides 
just the Noah's flood. There's a line in Job, a, a, a verse where, and Yahweh said to the sea, hitherto shalt thou come, and, but no further, and here shall thy proud ways be stayed. Don't keep encroaching. Um, the Epic of Gilgamesh is an earlier, another early story that, uh, uh, pre that presents a flood, and many people think it is the precursor to the biblical story. Um, one of the most important ones uh, and most detailed is Plato's books on Atlantis, and probably, I find that most audiences never heard of these two books. It was actually, uh, you hear about uh, Atlantis, but uh, the two books where he talked about them are Critias and Timaeus, and we always hear those very sensationalist things about the city and what it was like, but I'll get some, uh, I'll show you some examples of much more commonplace discussion he has in there about what happens with sea level, well, with, with floods. Now, I'm assuming that many of the discussions about floods, they didn't know whether the, the water was rising or the land was falling, and I think a lot of those relate to this issue of sea level rise. One of the most interesting is the Mahabharata. It's one of the oldest written documents, 100,000 couplets in Sanskrit. Um, I have read the, an abridged version of it. It's fascinating, very imaginative. Uh, uh, you, you read in there about flying vehicles. You read about uh, uh, what sounds like a nuclear war, people losing their hair and fingernails afterward. Uh, you read about um, uh, one case where a woman is going to have 100 babies and you assume it's going to be in the usual way and when you re read into it, it's in, in vitro uh, for, uh, gestation. Um, now, uh, I mentioned the waters of chaos. The recurring theme in those early documents uh, is that the waters of chaos would to come every so often and destroy the world and it would have to rebuild after that. And if you look at one cycle of the uh, sea level effects, and remember that what's happening here is the glaciers are melting and filling the oceans and then the glaciers are uh, advancing and the oceans go down as the ice uh, locks up so much of the water. So what we're saying here, and we're not the only ones to say that there may be um, a kind of a golden age when there's more land available. And that's a time when any new physical mutation or any new uh, cultural invention may work quite well. There's no competition. But then when it goes the other way, when the sea level is rising and you're losing land, uh, then natural selection kicks in and you begin to lose people and lose the less competitive traits. Um, I want to make it clear though that the person who originally suggested that only knew about what was happening at the glacial end. He knew about the land that was created as glaciers recede, but he didn't know about what was happening in the sea. And what my brother and I brought to that argument is to say, well, it's happening in the sea and it's even a bigger, much larger territory that's affected and much better territory. I'll say something about that later. So what's different about ours? Well, uh, we call it uh, uh, hypsographic response, which refers to the, the elevations uh, of the Earth. But um, if you look at the standard theory about how evolution and, and human uh, culture have taken place, um, start with that first appearance of modern humans about 120,000 years ago and then you get some uh, very early debatable evidence of tools about 90,000 years ago, art about 37,000 years ago, uh, agriculture about 16,000 years ago, and then it takes off. But it's a smooth curve. What we're saying is if you impose the sea level on that and then Take that to the, the next question about how it affects human populations. Then you end up with something more like this, where you say, well, maybe before the, 
that first rise 120,000 years ago, there may have been a, some little more advanced level of culture that forced us to the kind of natural selection that drove us to what we are today. Um, and over time, every time the sea level would go down, cultures would advance. Every time sea level went up, they would retreat, sometimes catastrophically. Now, that land had never even been named before. It's, it's like a vast millennial tide. And I wrote a paper several years ago where I, I said, we ought to name it, and let's call it Aquaterra. Sometimes it's water, sometimes it's land. 120, I mean, uh, uh, 400 feet of elevation. Uh, there is a, um, I said that we look back to see if these ancient cultures were aware of it. If you read the Mahabharata, the last, one of the last scenes in it is Krishna the death of Krishna, and Krishna is actually fleeing from the rising sea. He's going up the cliffs, up the hillsides, and the sea is overtaking him, and then he dies and the water overtakes his body. So they, they had this idea that the seas could rise. Um, now I'm going to, I'm going to read some poetry now. There, there are uh, seven poets, uh, poems in the book. Uh, if, you're, if you love poetry, then Rejoice that there are seven of them. If you don't, be glad there are only seven. <laughs> uh, but the, the context of these, we have, po uh, we have described a culture at 10,700 years ago that is pre-Egyptian in, in terms of its level, but uh, the precursor to the Egyptian culture um, and several others around the world. Um, but when we talk about some of these more fantastic things, like what, what comes from the Mahabharata, we put it in their lore. So they, it's been handed down to them. And what you're going to hear now is the old shaman, the, all the young men, the rite of passage, they're all out on a pyramid that's already covered partly with water. The water's coming up. And they're on this pyramid, and, and it's a very uh, mysterious uh, setting, and he can take different voices and all. Uh, so I'm going to read the first poem, and, and I want to make one point about that. And this one is back in the, that very earliest time. It's the story of the most advanced culture that's in their lore. So it's dated back at 140,000 years ago. Listen, who is she? Ancestor queen of unknown line in pearl white robes of shimmering shine. What says she? Must end all war or all is lost, she warns her world of holocaust. Who stands beside this woman, this woman of peace? A celestial choir now chants and sings, voices rise till heaven rings, yet never reach their earthly kings. What be they, these tales of the time before? The secrets of old were far more immense than any imagined or learned ever since. Science is one from mind's first waking consumed by fire of man's own making. From whence came this fire, this secret burning fire? From battle sky where thunders dwell, 10,000 strong the iron bolts fell. 80,000 years the secrets waned by Sin Juan's day were part regained. What sight surrounds this angelic choir? Domes of red and streaks of gold, Smoke and light of dreams untold. Silver shadows pierce the sky, streamers trailing white and high. What final act does she perform? Engraving the bar with symbols terse, she notes the end of song and verse. Her silver red silver staff reflects the rays of iron bolts thrown from Vimana's bays. Do not forget. And they all end in this, they all start with the listen and end in this uh, do not forget. Now, um, I want to uh, say a little more about Plato's uh, story about Atlantis. It's, uh, as I say, most people think of the sensationalist aspects of it, but really it's a very poignant and very uh, straightforward, common sense kind of explanation. And this is how we treat it in a, a discussion among some geographers at a conference, uh, actually they're around it drinking beer, which is the same thing at a conference. Uh, so here's the text from our uh, treatment of that. By the way, Andreas, if you want to visualize a world-class global hazard, read Plato's Timaeus. 
Solon, a Greek, wanted to entice his Egyptian host to talk about antiquity by mentioning some of the earliest history of his own land. The priest replied, O Solon, Solon, you Hellenes are never anything but children, and there is not an old man among you. There is no old opinion handed down among you by ancient tradition, nor any science which is hoary with age, and I will tell you why. There have been and will be again many destructions of mankind arising out of many causes. The greatest have been brought about by the agents of fire and water. When the earth is destroyed by fire, those who live upon the mountains and in dry and lofty places are more liable to destruction than those who dwell by rivers or on the, shore, or the seashore. When the gods purge the earth with a deluge of water, the survivors in your country are herdsmen and shepherds who dwell on the mountains. But those who, like you, live in cities are carried by the rivers into the sea. And one of the other characters, Rick says, this is my brother's character, the human dimension of global catastrophe couldn't be stated more clearly or elegantly than that. Oh, but it was, Baldy continued. Next, the ancient priest said, if there were any actions, noble or great, or in any other way remarkable, they have been written down by us of old and are preserved in our temples. Whereas just when you and other nations are beginning to be provided with letters and the other requisites of civilized life, after the usual interval, I love that, that commonplace phrase, after the usual interval, the stream from heaven, like a pestilence, comes pouring down and leaves only those of you who are destitute of letters and education. And so you have to begin all over again like children and know nothing of what happened in ancient times. Now, isn't that precisely what we fear today? Aren't we afraid of losing our history? Well, I wasn't before, but I am now, Andrea said solemnly. Now, I'm going to take you uh, quite a few tens of thousands of years farther on, and what I'm going to illustrate here is uh, the quest to save those secrets of the ages. We ultimately uh, suggest that they learn to put them in pyramids, and that was the the, uh, the device that finally worked. But this is where they're still trying to do that. And this is where the sea level is rising. They know it's going to destroy their civilization uh, at about 65,000 years ago. And I'm going to read you another one of the uh, poems from the Night on the Pyramid. Listen, who is he? He is the Sin One, aged and grand, named for that which steals his land. What says he, this water king? Move quickly, he calls to men who slave, hauling stout loads to night dark cave. What carry they, these men of yore? Secrets of the ages, legacy wise, slogging through mud, they carry the prize to seal for the ages against sea rise. Where go they, these secret saviors? To Echo Cove, this pristine vault, they spiral up, they seldom halt. Swaddled and cradled, the cash arrives, saving some knowledge that yet survives. What says he, the sin one? All is lost, the sea is won, all able must follow, my trusted son. For the old and weak, it is too late. This echo trove will seal our fate. Do not forget. Now, we're going to fast forward to the next sea level fall, and they, their lore has told them where this cave is, and they're looking for that cave. Listen, who is he? He is the Marawan, lured from the north, named for that which draws him forth. What says he, this seafloor king? The Sinwan's cave is dry again, the echo trove lies deep within. What claims he, the Marawan? The secret wall I now can see, sacred source of geometry, Sinwan's gift to eternity. We modestly use the term geometry instead of geography. For... <laughs> what do they, the followers, what do they, the followers of the Marawan, the seafloor king? Spreading out to left and right, they scour this shore in dark of night. First light finds each faithful soul, exploring and probing each unknown hole. What say thee, these searchers for troves? Here, calls a boy, too eager to please. False hope, yells the captain who oversees. Take care, a mother warns your flock. You'll bash your butt on that flip slick rock. <laughs> what find they, these soldiers of the Marawan? A young lieutenant shouts the news, a cave's been found by distant crews. Encrusted rocks beyond this cove conceal the way to Echo Trove. What does he, the seafloor king? 
Arriving at the entrance late this day, he calls for lanterns to, lanterns to guide his way. Through earth and ages, he eagerly climbs, seeking all secrets from ancient times. What find they, the Marawan and his soldiers? The echo trove lies safe and dry, with mummies reposed and staffs piled high. With leaping hearts, they scan the hoard. Heritage lost has been restored. What sees he now, this seafloor king? A soldier points in fearful trust to rotted heaps of yellow dust. Wisdom saved through ancient deed, forever lost to future seed. What says he now, this grieving king? My people will prosper along new shore, but the Sinwan's gift was so much more. Scooping some dust in the cup of his hand, the Marawan sheds a tear for his land. Do not forget. Now, the truth is that there were very prominent medieval legends that uh, told of an ancient king who saw the great flood and built pyramids to store the secrets of the ages, geometry, physics, and technology. And in particular, a, a very prominent geographer, Ibn Battuta, claimed that the Egyptian god Toth, having ascertained the deluge would take place, built the pyramids to contain books of science and knowledge. Now let's talk a second about the geography behind the quest. Um, that black area on here is the land that is, uh, was exposed 20,000 years ago and is inundated today. You see one of the largest areas in South, off Southeast Asia, that's uh, the Sunda area. Um, but when we read about that in archeological or anthropological literature, quite often they just refer to it as a land bridge, which is the idea that, sort of myopic idea that we think, oh, ancient people wanted to get from one place we know today to another place we know today. Well, these were vast coastal plains, and people lived in them, that's for certain. It's equivalent to North America in size. That is enormous. Imagine losing a continent today. What would that do to world population? But it's a better land than that. It's all flat, entirely flat, entirely coastal, and mostly tropical. So this is the best place to live during the Ice Age. Um, so how do we find these, these, ev this evidence if there is anything? I originally was thinking, oh, we might be looking for some low buildings or something like that, uh, which certainly existed. Um, but um, it was my brother who said, had a, I thought a brilliant idea. I don't often say that about my brother. But, <laughs> but he said, you know, sea level rise could explain step pyramids. If you wanted to hold on to a, a point of land, say, and the sea is rising, you build a platform. And if it rises again, you're going to have to build another platform, a little smaller than the one before, so it'll have some structural integrity to it. And you keep doing that, and eventually you've got a pyramid, whether you started to build one or not. Uh, so I became fascinated with Sudanese pyramids. There are more in Sudan than there are in Egypt. In fact, the country that has the most pyramids is Sudan. Uh, and they always have this same form to them. Uh, have a uh, they're, they're very steep, steeper than Egyptian pyramids, and the ones that we know about, at least, are not as high. And they always have this offertory chapel out on the eastern end, facing east. Um, so if we were to restore that, and I was, you know, for the purposes of the book, I graphically uh, raised it so it was taller. Um, that's what it would look like, fully restored. This is what it would look like underwater. It would be covered with reefs. Uh, Coral reefs, coral would cover it. Coral has to have a solid substrate. So uh, we postulated then that maybe there are structures under the ocean that are covered with coral. Uh, what would it take to find them? Well, they'd probably be about 30 meters across. And in order to find that with uh, digital elevation or bathymetry data, you'd probably need uh, about a, a data resolution of about two meters, uh, what is the, I mean, that's the, the uh, that's a conservative estimate of what you would need. It, it might be more than that, but what's the most precise resolution we have for our ocean data worldwide, de ocean depth? 10 kilometers. It's very coarse. In other words, if it's there, we wouldn't know it. So how do you find it? Well, um, yeah, 10 kilometers. So I, I had this idea of how to search for it. I said, if we 
uh, if I find a place where coral reefs are in the midst of sand, they're, they're not, there's no solid straight, uh, substrate around them, so maybe they're on a building or, uh, and they touch the surface. If they touch the surface, they have to show up on a nautical chart because they're a hazard to shipping. And they will be called um, either a uh, rocks awash or a, um, a seca is the Arab word for them. We, um, or so I literally searched every nautical chart for the whole earth looking for these features. And I found them in a lot of places. I found them in the Sunda Strait. I found them uh, all around the uh, Indian Ocean. And in particular, I'm going to point, I'll look to the Red Sea there over on the far west. There is a bay there called Fowl Bay. It's called Fowl because it has so many coral reefs. It's, not, it's foul for navigation. Um, now, I'm going to do a little aside here to, to say some, some real world adventures that were involved. Practically every place we mention the book, either he's been there or I've been there, and it's, re it's presented as, as we experienced it. And we were trying to get to Fowl Bay. He went through 41 military checkpoints and never made it all the way. He was under gu armed guard with an armed convoy, and he never made it into Fowl Bay. I went back later and worked with the, uh, uh, tried to do it officially. I tried to go to the agencies in, in uh, Cairo and get permission, and I uh, never got it. Uh, the, the offices, I, the diagram of that looks like a wiring diagram. It's, it's unbelievable, and I never got the permission. Uh, and there's some scenes in, in the book where I describe what it was like with Mubarak's Egypt. This was 1998 or 9. And so you have uh, I, one of the offices I went to, they were handing out weapons to these people who are going out on the street. So you see all these people with, with rifles on the street, and then you know that there are all these others I was seeing with uh, concealed weapons on the street. Um, so here's what that bay looks like. There are 304 of these patch corals, the, the ones that are standing out by themselves, uh, and it's very uh, suspicious. Uh, we call them, uh, in, in English, they're called rocks awash. In Arabic, they're called sekas. And so in the, the novel, uh, in the ancient part, we, little trick there, we name rooftops or domes of houses as secas, so the term shoal comes from the, uh, these things getting covered by water. Um, now, if we look at that area today, you see that um, when sea level was lower, there was no Suez, uh, Gulf of Suez. It was a much longer trek overland. So the shortest land trek, if you wanted to go from the Mediterranean to the Red Sea, uh, the shortest one would be to go down to the first cataract of the Nile and turn left and go across to this bay. So if, that, if there's any commerce, that bay would have been uh, the most central location on Earth. There's nothing like it today. There's nothing today that is that central. Um, even the Panama Canal or the, or the Suez Canal, uh, this one you would have had to have gone through to go from the Atlantic Mediterranean world to the Red Sea, Indian Ocean, Pacific world. So that's where we place a lot of the action in that framework. Now I'm going to say a little about geographic technology for those who are techno freaks. Um, this is describing uh, our main character as he discovers what he's been looking for. He's out on the ocean. He's been there for days. Uh, he's doing a, a, a very rigorous field investigation as we would do in geography. As evening passed into night, Kaysen excitedly scanned the field station screen to ensure that every seca had been covered, every arc traversed. After 10 days of constant labor, the survey was finished. 
With nimble fingers maneuvering the pointer and clicking keys, he rushed to clear the screen. A 3D image of Foul Bay's bottom began forming at the top. Steadily, tier after tier, the mesh-like drawing progressed downward. Abruptly, the display went blank. Now, that's the battery goes dead. I, you know, you introduce <laughs> something like that to hold the suspense a little longer. Uh, later in the night, he held his breath as the 3D image again formed from top to bottom. The eerie specter was a jumble of bright yellow lines against a black background. There was only one word to describe what he saw, and the word was city. Not just any city, but a great city. Its street pattern resembled modern London and Philadelphia, but its three-dimensional form looked more like Washington, D.C., with all but the tallest monuments restricted to a few stories in height. Its vast expanse reminded him of L.A. Now, this is that same scene portrayed in the ancient story of 10,700 years earlier, and again, this is the uh, old shaman and the, the boys are out on this uh, step pyramid and they're learning the secrets of the ages. At sunrise, wisp of cottony red fog dissolved before their eyes and another step pyramid emerged between them and the sun. Within seconds, another spike appeared and grew into a pyramid, then another and another. As sunbeams slowly worked their way down the sacred steps, scores of structures <coughs> materialized. When light finally reached the ways below, throngs of buildings broke the flat surface of the sea. Some were sprawling temples and palaces, other obelisks no wider than a swimmer's common stroke. Tombs and granaries aligned with water-covered roadways, pyramids and palaces lined canals that once had been grand avenues. Temples and palaces formed a quadrangle surrounding a flat green sea. The chief priest reappeared in their midst and began the ancient ritual that would last until the next day's dawn. From beginning to end, Osi sat in rapt attention, but his eyes often wandered to the awesome scene behind the dais. A city someday to disappear beneath the waves, he thought, not to be seen for 10,000 years or more, an eerie beauty, a danger that will grow century by century. Already submerged rooftops are hazards. How many men will someday die with the cry of Seca on their lips? And uh, this is uh, in the prologue, or excuse me, the epilogue. Uh, this is a Google image. It's in that same area. And it looks very much like a submerged port city. Uh, not only is the general form right, but um, it's off the the coast of Egypt, uh, there are rectangular grids with light colored lines about 40 to 80 feet wide, in other words, about like a city street, and typically about 200 feet between center lines. If we look out here on what looks like piers, you see a 125 foot wide uh, prong-like pier, trident shape, and then 200 feet between the piers. So it would be small boats, but would be reasonable. Uh, 1,600 feet long for individual piers, 4,200 feet for uh, the whole overall pier. So I compared that to modern day, modern day uh, ports in that same area, and you see here one's 1,000 feet, the other's 20,000 feet, so they bracket. It's a reasonable size. Uh, one of my graduate students is doing a a study on this right now, and I have to uh, point out that this one would not be deep enough to be 10,700 years ago. This would be much later. It's very shallow water. Uh, what he's discovered is that, and, and this is just early stage, but he has discovered that there is a city that has been known since medieval times on the, the shore there, and it's supposed to be a port city, but doesn't have a port. So it's possible just possible that this is the port that's missing from that uh, city. It's possible that, that they're two different cities, and this was the one that was referenced in medieval times. So um, he's, he's looking into that, and uh, we'll see if he can resolve it. Now, I don't want you to think this is all about science. Uh, there is a love story that will take you through the whole thing, uh, the ancient part, uh, Osi and Bera in the saga, and this is a scene where they're, they're running from the enemy. They have gone into a cave, an enormous cave, and they've been, he's been there before, she has not. Uh, he's the leader of a, a sizable regiment of, 
of, of men. And they've entered in. Uh, inside the cavern, O.C. pointed to the sloping ledge he had wanted to explore when first passing through so long ago. It must climb to the surface above. Too dark to tell now, but I'm sure of it. We'll build back here and check it out at first light. Quito, his friend and, and fellow commander, stationed guards in front of the cavern's mouth inside it and on the rim above. Busa arranged soldiers in ordered lines across the chamber's floor. As bedrolls unfurled on either side of the gurgling stream, Bera led the children to a protected balcony high up the cavern wall. Osi returned to his men. What do you think you're doing, asked Quito, as Osi untied the straps of his bedroll. What does it look like? I'm bedding down. Not here, surely. Of course I'm sleeping here, just like always. You can't. You're an officer of the realm. You can't bed down with your men. That's crazy. I'll do as I please. Quito said nothing, but rather pointed up to a tiny balcony beneath the larger one where the children slept. Era. In the flickering torchlight, her diaphanous, diaphanous gown shimmered like the robes of an angel floating in shadows. O.C. thought she glanced his way, but in the darkness he couldn't be sure. Ever the conspirator, Quito whispered mischievously, now, if I were you and an officer of the realm, that's where I'd sleep tonight. <laughs> Perhaps you're right, O.C. growled. <laughs> Bunking with common soldiers is beneath the dignity of an officer of the realm. I'll do as I please. With mock resignation, he ascended the ramp. Stifling a laugh, Quito ambled to his own bed. When Osi reached the balcony, he stared dreamily at, la at last into those lovely eyes. He dropped his bedroll on the floor across from her. I'm here if you need me, he said. Um, so I'm going to end by just kind of uh, summarizing that, yes, the Border of Chaos is about ideas, but it's not just about ideas and not just about science. There's a lot of action in it. There's a lot of adventure. There is a, a lot of mystery. And uh, we offer suggestions for a lot of things, not just floods, but what, why did they say it was destroyed by fires, for instance? A lot of mystery that we're working with. And mystery in terms of the, the two storylines as well. Uh, romance, as I said. Uh, dare I say sex. There is sex in it. That went away quickly, didn't it? Uh, epic battles, exploration and discovery, modern and ancient, heroism, and one thing we're most proud of is the development of the characters. Now, I've even read some, some uh, reviews online that say, well, I had a little trouble getting into it, but once I got those characters going, I really enjoyed it. So thank you very much. Professor Dobson, yeah. is the amount of water on Earth a, a constant? That is to say, if you add up all the ice, all the fresh water, and all the water in the seas, is it a constant over how many years? It is essentially constant, except that you know, also have to consider the water vapor that's in the atmosphere. There's a sizable amount that's always tied up as water vapor. Uh, there is you know, there are questions about when the water arrived, or when, uh, but I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. But uh, there's no great input or output. I mean, what would it be? It'd be maybe a, you know, an asteroid, a, a meteor arrives with a little water. That's not going to change it much. So it's essentially constant. Are you winning any converts over on the, on the academic side? I'm sorry, what? Are you winning any of your scientific community over to your argument. Well, what have I written in scientific uh, journals? I wrote a, a, a related article that came out of this about uh, Neanderthal uh, evolution and the uh, essential uh, nature of iodine. And uh, what I found is that there was initially quite a bit of interest in that. Uh, uh, John Noble Wilford, who's the senior science correspondent of the New York Times, wrote an article about it, uh, half a page or so, and it went newspapers all over the world, uh, and what I found is that a lot of anthropologists didn't like it, but when, when you looked at what they were actually doing, they were saying that I had, uh, uh, I, I was using the creationist argument. Well, I didn't use that. I said the most likely thing was that it was the um, hereditary 
um, the mutation of the, in the thyroid was the answer, which is hereditary and therefore evolutionary. Uh, but I left it open that I really can't prove which way it went. Uh, but we do, in this book, we do mention the fact that humans have to have iodine. If you don't have it, you become uh, goitrous, and if you don't have it for a lifetime, you become cretinous, and uh, the sources are coastal. So that's why in the early times people might have lived in the coast and not have occupied the uplands. Hi, um, I'm sorry to take you off the topic of the book, but it says in the program you coined the term geoslavery. Could you explain that a little more? Um, I was at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the, uh, for 26 years before I came here. And uh, we had been one of the founding centers of geographic information systems, and in the 1998-99 time frame, uh, there's a lot of interest in technology transfer and to private industry. Uh, a fellow came in and wanted to use our technology to track children, and that is very common now. At that time, uh, when I, I objected to it, people said I was being futuristic. Uh, my complaint was that they, they call it for children, but in fact it could be used for husband, wife, could be used for businesses uh, or, or total strangers. Uh, so, uh, and I, I presented a talk on it, and one of my uh, friends who was editor of one of the main GIS journals at the time came to me and said he was concerned about it. He wanted to write with me. So we wrote the term uh, geoslavery. Um, we said that uh, basically the, the argument was that modern society, society has to consider a new form of slavery characterized by location control. And uh, that term has caught on. It's, it's being used heavily now. And uh, there's even a, a new uh, dictionary that um, tried to capture new thought-provoking words of the last decade or so. Not only did they put it in there, but they named the book uh, what, After Crimes, uh, Geoslavery, and Thermageddon or something like that. It's in the title of this dictionary. Yeah. So, yeah. Back to the technology question, I was wondering, you said there was such a gap between the technology available to us and then what we would need to maybe answer some of these questions. Can you comment on the progress that technology is making into hopefully helping us find these answers to what's, what's down there? Well, I, I don't think the, the main uh, uh, obstacles are technological. I think they're scientific resistance to looking at these questions. Uh, uh, there, there is a, I, I use the term uh, Atlantis phobia. I mean, people are so afraid to look at anything back there that, that they'll be labeled, labeled as an Atlantis freak, uh, kook, whatever. Uh, but I, I think it's more the cultural uh, objections that, that stop it from, stop us from really seriously looking at these things. I'm not sure I've quite got a grasp on the on the science that you're proposing that would be difficult for other scientists to accept. Is it, is it well, you, if you can just answer that general question. Also, uh, what are the presuppositions that, that you're working with here about the, may, I, I'm just beginning to learn some of this myself, about the evolution of human beings over the last, I thought basically our species began maybe 50,000 years ago, but you're taking it back if I understood your chart your Aqua Terra chart that you started with maybe 140 or so thousand years ago. No, 100, well, 120,000 is the standard understanding of when the first modern humans show up. Uh, and then, uh, but Neanderthals were here much earlier than that, 250,000 years or so. Um, and then modern hum humans replaced Neanderthals in Europe about uh, 40,000 years ago. There are some earlier dates, but now some of those are being debated. Uh, later dates, I mean, but some of those are being debated. And what is the composition of Oh, the idea that any civilization was ever high enough to, to show on the chart uh, would, would be very difficult for most people to accept. And the idea that any of the ancient uh, lore had a real uh, reality behind it would be difficult. Okay, thank you very much. And I'll go over to the, the same.